What is up, guys? It is Joe. I'm back. We're talking about the cats. We're talking about the portal, but this one's going to be a little bit different. I first off want to give a shout out to my guy, Ryan, for suggesting this video topic. It was really interesting. He hit me in the DMs on Twitter and tossed us out there something to potentially talk about. And I thought it was a great idea. You know, we get caught up so much in who the right guys are going to be coming to Manhattan. Who do we want? Who are we focused on? Who has K-State reached out to? All that and above. I think it's important to ask the question, how good is K-State at evaluating talent in the transfer portal? In today's video, I'm going to deep dive into that and discuss some different things from last year, from this year, for what to look for going forward with the portal. But before I do, let me say this. First of all, thank you for all the support. I appreciate each and every one of you tuning in. And if you like these videos and you want to stick around on the channel, be sure and consider subscribing. It does help me out immensely, and it continues to grow this tribe of K-State fans. We continue to add to each and every day. It takes about four seconds out of your schedule. And at the time we hit 2,000 subs, I'm going to be giving away a lavender quarter zip. As we get closer, once we get within 100 or so, I'll announce the details of how to enter that giveaway. It'll be pretty straightforward. We've done one. I gave one away at 1,000, and I'm excited to do the same at two. So once we hit that, be sure and be on the lookout for that update. But guys, let's start here. So the concept for this video is discussing how good is K-State at evaluating talent in the transfer portal. The idea that Ryan pitched me was round up each and every guy from last season that K-State was in deep talks with or got to a final cutdown list or really had some mutual interest in from both parties and evaluate their season and see how we did about picking out where that person could be at K-State. Great idea. Fire idea, and I loved it. So I jumped on it, and I went through and found six, seven, eight guys that we were in on, and we're going to discuss how their seasons went, evaluate each person, and see how good K-State is at developing top-tier talent through the portal. Now, for the sake of this list, I left off guys like Arthur Kaluma, Tyler Perry, the different guys you get in the transfer portal that came to K-State because... I know that I have a, a purple colored glasses looking at those dudes. This is just the dudes we missed out on, but we're in deep talks with. Starting off with one guy that I was really hoping we ended up with, West Virginia's Raekwon Battle. So Raekwon Battle obviously was connected to K-State through the Montana State game. Maybe it was just the fan base, but we kicked around the idea of going after Battle through the portal after that Montana State game in the NCAA tournament where he made 1,000 shots and scored 800 points on us. I was all in. However, I understand also why K-State didn't go after him too hard. Because at the time, he didn't have waiver eligibility, so there was that complicated issue with the NCAA. Obviously, it goes on to be okay. Now people don't need waivers to play multiple places within a span of a couple years. That being said, shelf all that conversation. Raekwon Battle ends up going from Montana State to West Virginia after being, I think it was the Big Sky Player of the Year. I think that's the conference Montana State's in. I could be wrong about that. But you could see the scoring aspect from Raekwon Battle off the jump. Now, understandably... Going from a school like Montana State jumping to the Big 12, there's questions about how you convert. Raekwon Battle didn't have any questions. The dude knew what he was about. He went out there and balled out. This season, he averaged 16 points, 4 rebounds, and didn't have many assists to talk about. I mean, 0.7 per game. But the dude doesn't play assist basketball. He is there to score. He's there to be the best scorer on the court, and sometimes there's nothing you can do about that. I think that is a hit in the portal. If you would have brought Raekwon Battle in, that's a good addition to the team. Whether we talk about fit, sharing the ball, whatever... But the important part for this argument is K-State is one for one on a hit there as a guy you know was going to be successful in the Big 12. Moving on to the next player. Max Azemus, there was no doubt that he'd be a really, really, really great player wherever he ended up. But there's still the element of, okay, you're coming from Oral Roberts, jumping to the Big 12. There could be some conversion ways of different things to discuss. K-State was the last team to be cut from Max Azemus' list, and then he eventually went to go to Texas. He did visit K-State, but we had some weather issues and different things going on. And from what I understand, we offered the same NIL money as Max Azemus, but that being said, Azemus had a stud season. He's one of the best scorers in college basketball. Had 16.8 points per game, 4.1 assists per game, and 3.1 rebounds per game. He was a pure point guard, great player, and he went on to be really successful at Texas. That's a hit as well. Two for two. Next guy up. And I know that a lot of these guys on this list are big names that average 15, 16 points at smaller schools, but there is still the element of, if you don't know a guy that's going to come off from a tiny school, maybe not a tiny school, but like, a Tyke Green, who averaged 20 points at his previous school, goes out there and averages two or three points because he's a role guy. You never know where guys are going to be. If they're going to be a role player, if they're going to be a star, this video is about determining how K-State did it, determining which guys are stars and which guys not to go after. Ray J. Dennis from Baylor, one of the best additions of anybody in the transfer portal. And honestly, this is the guy you're looking for in the portal. This is the type of basketball player you want to bring in if you're looking for a point guard. A guy who can take over games. I mean, he had so many clutch buckets down the stretch. He showed up biggest in the NCAA tournament, played really great. Had 13.6 points per game, 6.7 assists per game. I think that was in the top 20 in the nation, and then 3.9 rebounds per game. Coming out of Toledo, he was the conference player of the year, I believe, as well. Or just a stud. I can't remember off the top of my head. But 
Ray J. Dennis was also a hit. Like, you're three for three on guys that you know are going to be successful. And the thing about this list, it's not just guys we reached out to. It is guys that were really interested in K-State, vice versa, had them in their top couple, and they picked somebody else over us. That's an okay conversation to have. The next person to add, Aaron Estrada. This was an early one in the transfer portal where Estrada was one of, like, I mean, I feel like it was the first month, maybe the first couple of weeks of the portal. He had, from what I remember, Cincinnati was up there, K-State was up there, and Alabama was up there. Might have been a fourth school, I can't remember off the top of my head. But Estrada was coming off a year at Hofstra where he averaged just under 20 points a game. Really good score, really solid point guard. He kind of continued that streak at Alabama, obviously with a little bit of a diminished role. Uh, He ended up averaging 13.3 points, 5.4 rebounds, and 4.7 assists per game. That's another hit. That's another star. Now, this one's a bit of a jump, and we're starting to get to the point of the list where you start to question certain things in different spots. This portal guy wasn't coming from a small school. This wasn't like a, well, we'll see if he can convert to top-level basketball. This is Olivier Kamwa. He, I'm pretty sure from what I remember, and this is just going back to last year's videos, he ended up visiting K-State and, for whatever reason, didn't choose it, ended up going to uh, excuse me, Michigan as one of their power forwards and ended up averaging 14.8 points, 7.1 rebounds, and 2.8 assists. He was a stud. He played well. He had a good year. But you weren't really questioned about the fit. If you're coming off of a season at Tennessee, you know, multiple seasons at Tennessee, I should say, you're not going to go to the Big 12 and forget how to play basketball in a certain sense. This is the one where the list starts to round out into some interesting situations. Joe Toussaint. You know, I'm going to be straight up. I doubted Joe Toussaint about his ability to realistically be more than a role player. And that's on me. I think Joe Toussaint was one of the one of the best identifying guys in the portal. Like, he really, really improved his stock at Texas Tech. Joe Toussaint went out there and took over games. He was tough. He was gritty. You know, you couldn't really pick on him on defense because of his size. He still had the toughness to maintain some of that. This past season, it was his best year of his career. He ended up averaging 12.2 points per game, 4.3 assists per game, and 2.6 rebounds per game. Uh, coming off multiple seasons at West Virginia, went to Texas Tech. It was between K-State and Texas Tech. Apparently, there was a bidding war. Texas Tech won out, whatever the case is, so on and so forth. Joe Toussaint was a hit. That was one that I I didn't anticipate to be a hit. He absolutely proved me wrong. He proved a lot of people wrong. I would assume even West Virginia staff that would have liked to retain him, but obviously they didn't make him as much of a priority as he could have been. He was a stud. Absolute stud. Absolute win for Grant McCaslin in in Tech. Uh, The next two dudes are dudes that didn't quite work out. You know, the first six dudes on this list, like, you identified the right guys, you were in the right races, and you hit. I mean, you did the right thing in these in these spots. Like, what more are you going to do outside of, you know, pay a guy another 250 grand to get him to go to K-State? Whatever the case is. Now, the next guy on the list was one that kind of pulled a fast one over all of K-State and made a lot of people look stupid, including myself, who reported it basically as a done deal. I learned my lesson on that one. Mo Wigi. Uh, Mohamed Wigi transferred for West Virginia. Didn't do a ton. I mean, he's coming off a freshman season, so he didn't see much production. And he was really seeing about 10 to 12 minutes a game. And he ended up going to Alabama because they offered him a bag and a half, from what I understand. That's alleged. I don't know that for a fact, but it's Alabama. It is what it is. Mo Wiggy ended up averaging 3.3 points per game and 2.6 rebounds. But the kicker is he only played 8.9 minutes a game. You know, I get that. You get a guy like Grant Nelson in the portal. You get guys ahead of him that are going to play more and command more respect. I get that. Uh, it's not that Mo Wiggy wasn't a hit, but he definitely wasn't being viewed as okay, we need him as a starter. His role was filled by Will McNair, and I would argue that Will McNair had a much better season than what Mo Wiggy would have offered to K-State. The next player up, and this is one that there was a lot of attention about and it would have been a massive thing had it worked out. Ernest Ude, the center transfer from Kansas, ends up choosing TCU over K-State, but uh, there was a lot of storm brewing with Ernie coming to K-State. Did never make it to Manhattan, but it sounds like there was a lot of interest. He was one that I was really high on because you see the intangibles. You see the athleticism. You see the size. You saw flashes at Kansas, and you thought that, okay, this guy's going to be a starter. If you can keep him on the court for 30 minutes, he can be an absolute dog in the low block. TCU didn't really utilize that, I would say. Uh, Ernie did start with TCU this past season, but ended up averaging 4.3 points and 5.3 rebounds per game. Uh, Played 17.3 minutes per game, which I, I... I question, but obviously they have a couple guys over there that are pretty big and solid on the low block. Call it what you will, I I don't know that Ernie would have been a hit, um, but I think he would have had a much better opportunity at K-State to play upwards of, I mean, 17.3 minutes is kind of ridiculous to be honest, but that isn't exactly the role I anticipated for him as a sophomore, as a top-tier sophomore going into the portal. Ernest Uday would have been a miss, or at least was presented as a miss at TCU. K 
K-State could have been a different story, but for the sake of it, Mo Wigi and Ernest Uday would be the guys that you missed on. You identified stars correctly in Raekwon Battle, Max Azemus, Ray J. Dennis, Aaron Estrada, Olivier Kamwa, and Joe Toussaint. Now here's the observation from this. Kansas State staff did a great job. Because also, you're not coaching Mo Wigi and Ernest Uday to be 40-minute guys, not 40 minutes, but 32-minute guys that are going to be your starter and be the best player on the court at all times. Ernie more than Mo Wigi, but neither are going to see the court more than probably 30 minutes on a given night uh, just because of their youth and their inexperience. That's how it goes. What I think my biggest takeaway is is looking at this, this list, and Joe Tucson is the outlier. So that's Joe Tucson's kind of an enigma in my mind, but I feel like at times, and it's not just an R staff thing, I almost wonder if Big 12 experience is overvalued rel- relative to what is out there in the portal. And I'm not saying that anyone would make the case to take like, you know, if you have a, a choice between Max Azemus and Joe Toussaint, you're going to take Max Azemus just because you see the history, you know what the case is. If you have the choice between Olivier Kamwa and Mo Wiki, you're going to take uh, Kamwa because of the proven production. But for guys that average, you know, just under eight minutes in their career, Leading into this, I think you almost chalked it up as a little bit more than what's out there. Like, you know, I know Will McNair wasn't a fan favorite for a lot of people, but he had a better season than Mo Wiggy and Ernest Dude. And he didn't play all that many more minutes than him, but they both had um, down years relative to what Will McNair was able to bring. And I bring Will McNair up because he was such a late addition that he was filling that last roster spot where the big would have been. So I think where you see this is that K-State identified a guy at Montana State, a guy at Oral Roberts, a guy at Hofstra, uh, you know, so on and so forth, Toledo, that converted to the Big 12 and played all-conference-level basketball. That's the biggest part of this. But what you want your staff to be successful at is developing guys from smaller schools and turning them into stars or bringing them into the light and then the light's not being too bright for them. So that would be the case, I'd say, with Battle, with Azemus, with Dennis, Estrada. You know, there's a bunch of different dudes you can mention in that, but I feel good knowing that the staff is going to attack the transfer portal and understand which guys have a conversion rate to the Big 12. Now, what you're probably thinking is like, well, if a kid averages 15, he's going to be fine. It's not always the case, man. I know that uh, we sometimes look at guys in the portal and be like, this kid shoots 40% from three. He's a career 12, 13-point guy. He's going to be a stud. Then they get to the big universities, they play eight minutes a game, and they're missing shots or doing whatever the case is. It's just not always a smooth transition. So out of the 100 guys, let's just say there's 100 guys out there that fit the 15, 5, and 5, shooting 38, 37% from three, I would argue that 30 of those will be guys that uh, actually stay at their university and make some real headwind, while the other 70, you know, 65 guys are transferring again the next year. There's a lot of stuff to keep an eye on with that. And I know this list is kind of fluid of different guys that we were in on, but it does go to show you that you should have faith in the coaching staff in understanding and identifying key players. That being said, I'm going to get out of here and we'll talk again here soon. Uh, I'm actually on the road right now, so this video is recorded a couple days in advance. If there's some massive news, which I assume there will be, I will be broadcasting live from Minnesota on a trip to see my girlfriend right now, so that's uh, where I will be at, and I will have the rolling setup with me, but... As we get going, I'm excited to talk to you guys here next. And we're going to have a good month. The plan, if you're seeing this, I guess this would be Thursday when you're seeing this, more than likely. The plan is going to be every other day upload, just so you guys know the schedule, just so you know where I'm coming from. So I wouldn't expect daily uploads, but if there's a ton of news, it might change up. So I appreciate each and every one of you guys. Once again, thank you so much for watching. I will talk to you soon. Go Cats!